Hey everybody, today I'm going to be sharing a longer section from my book, A Christian Case Against Donald Trump. I'll put a link to the book on Amazon below. And this is the very beginning of chapter one. So if this is the first time that you're seeing one of my videos, you can find this whole series on my YouTube channel, Culture, Faith, and Politics. All the videos are in a playlist called A Christian Case Against Donald Trump. So you can start at the top and listen all the way through. So this section doesn't need very much explanation. It's basically the beginning of my argument that I'll be making throughout the rest of the book. So here we go. An act of love. I'm writing this book as an act of love for Jesus, for his church, for my country. I'm writing to preserve some things that I find precious and perhaps to lend a hand to improve some areas where we're falling short. This book is an act of love for my children as well and for their children. I've experienced so much beauty in this world. I want to preserve those things that I find beautiful and leave the generations that follow an even better world than the one that I inherited. That's what being a conservative used to mean back in the before times. An act of worship. Even more than an act of love, this book is an act of worship. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Over the past several years, I've offered the best of what I have, my time, my focus, my most rigorous thinking, to this labor that many others have also taken on, this ugly, holy work of exposing and defeating the creeping shadow of Trumpism. And that shadow has enveloped large swaths of the American church, and many of God's people now walk in darkness. They scorn the truth-tellers and they shun those who expose the lies and deception. And sadly, in doing so, they believe that they're offering a service to God. So for myself, this work has become a twofold act of worship. First, I'm working to tear down a deceptive and destructive version of Christianity that slanders God for profit and power, that dares to weaponize God's name against people he loves, people he created in his own image. And second, I hope to lift up Jesus so people might see him as far more beautiful and worthy of praise than any earthly political leader. Why I say we. Throughout this book, you'll notice that I use the word we far more than the words you or they. Here's why. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. So by my use of language, I'm owning my place in the body of Christ. If you're a follower of Jesus, even though we might disagree with each other's political choices, we're still connected by one spirit. We can't simply disown one another. Even if I'd rather not take the risk to speak, I owe you my voice. And even if you'd rather not hear me, you owe me or someone like me your attention. If we call ourselves followers of Jesus, we're one body. And we owe one another the respect of our shared membership in Christ's body. So when I say we have done such and such wicked thing, I'm not accusing you of doing anything that you don't choose to own for yourself. And I'm not saying that I did that specific thing. But I'm owning my corporate responsibility and everything that Christ's people have done. We won't get anywhere by pointing fingers towards our sisters and brothers and away from ourselves, as tempting as that may be. So even when I speak most harshly against the people of God, perhaps especially then, I'm still aware that we're all one body, 
united, however uncomfortably at times, by the Spirit. Christians made Donald Trump. So before we talk about Donald Trump, we've got to talk about us. We have to own the unrighteous face that we've shown the world in recent years. We dare not look away. We owe it to Jesus to take seriously the criticisms our neighbors bring against us because of our support for Trump. As Christians, we don't have the option of ignoring what's being done in Christ's name. This book offers an opportunity for self-examination. I'll share many accounts of Donald Trump's words and actions, and I'll provide references for those accounts. It's possible we could disagree on what some of those accounts mean, but please don't simply dismiss them. We've all been shaped by Trump's role in our public life, for better or worse, so we owe it to ourselves to survey the impact. To the extent that we excuse accounts of his words and actions as fake news or no big deal or not as bad as his opponent, that's the extent to which Trump's worldview has begun to shape our own. The past eight years have brought a steady corruption of the Christian conscience, a normalization of things we would have found abhorrent only eight years earlier. We've accepted things in Donald Trump that shook me to the point of almost giving up. I'm writing this book because I still hope to reach people. But it's crushing to realize that Christians still support Trump after, for example, he's been found by a jury to have committed the exact kind of sexual assault he bragged about committing in the Access Hollywood tape. I can't imagine a universe where that makes sense. And would we have believed eight years ago that someday we'd witness what Emma Green describes in the Atlantic magazine as a Christian insurrection? We all saw on January 6, 2021, what she describes. The name of God was everywhere during Wednesday's insurrection against the American government. The mob carried signs and flags declaring, Jesus saves and God guns and guts made America. Let's keep all three. The name of God was everywhere. That sentence drives this entire book. I'm calling out the chasm between what that sentence should mean and what it does mean today. This book is about the kingdom of God. One day, the name of God will be everywhere, but not like that, not that way. Followers of Jesus are in this world to lift up the name of God as beautiful. Wherever we do that in his way, by the power of his spirit, that's where the world can catch a glimpse of the kingdom of God. But people died during and after the attack on the Capitol. Hundreds of police officers were injured. At one point, the crowd chanted for Mike Pence to be hanged. The people who lifted the name of God on their signs as they stormed the Capitol did not display the beauty of God. They took his name in vain. They made his name an abomination to those who don't know him and paraded it before the world. Mitch McConnell, the Republican leader in the Senate, gambled and lost that Trump could never come back from the stain of what he did in the weeks leading up to January 6th. So in the Senate trial after Trump's impeachment by the House, McConnell chose not to convict. He chose not to needlessly anger Trump's constituency. But he told the truth about Trump's actions in his speech on the Senate floor. Please read that entire speech. It's a time capsule for how Republican politicians talked about Trump for a brief few weeks after the insurrection. McConnell made a strong case against Trump. If he and his colleagues had chosen to press that case, I wouldn't have to write this book. So here's a sample of what he said. January 6th was a disgrace. American citizens attacked their own government. They used terrorism to try to stop a specific piece of domestic business they did not like. Fellow Americans beat and bloodied our own police. They stormed the Senate floor. They tried to hunt down the Speaker of the House. They built a gallows and chanted about murdering the Vice President. They did this because they'd been fed wild falsehoods by the most powerful man on earth. 
because he was angry he lost an election. Former President Trump's actions preceded the riot were a disgraceful, disgraceful dereliction of duty. There's no question, none, that President Trump is practically and morally responsible for provoking the events of the day. No question about it. The people who stormed this building believed they were acting on the wishes and instructions of their president. And having that belief was a foreseeable consequence of the growing crescendo of false statements, conspiracy theories, and reckless hyperbole, which the defeated president kept shouting into the largest megaphone on planet Earth. Many Republican politicians and Christian leaders echoed those sentiments in the day after the insurrection. But before long, the Trump intimidation machine kicked in. Within weeks, those same politicians and Christian leaders humiliated themselves once more by bending the knee to the man that they'd so recently condemned. That's how a few years later, on March 16th, 2024, Trump could get away with holding a rally in Ohio and standing before his predominantly Christian crowd, shamelessly salute the very people who attacked the Capitol. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the horribly and unfairly treated January 6th hostages. And you see the spirit from the hostages, and that's what they are as hostages. They've been treated terribly and very unfairly, and you know that, and everybody knows that. And we're going to be working on that soon. The first day we get into office, we're going to save our country, and we're going to work with the people to treat those unbelievable patriots, and they were unbelievable patriots and are. You see the spirit just cheering, they're making the cheering while they're doing that, and they did that in prison, and it's a disgrace in my opinion. Why do people who love their country allow Trump to wrap himself in the American flag while attacking the very principles the flag represents? If I were a veteran, or if I had served in law enforcement, I'd probably write a book that shows the inherent contradictions that Trump poses to people with those backgrounds. But I come from a pastoral background, so I'm focused on the damage it does to my own people when they defend the indefensible, when they normalize the absurd. When will we speak honestly about the rot and the dysfunction that our embrace of Donald Trump has introduced into our churches? How can we begin to measure the damage our support for this man has done to the reputation of Christ in the world? Do we even care? about the very real, flesh-and-blood human beings he's hurt, using the power that we handed him. Trump received about 80% of the white evangelical vote in both 2016 and 2020, and once again this year, white evangelicals gave him his strongest base of support in the primaries. I'll say it again, even after everything we've learned about Trump, evangelical Christians remained his strongest supporters in the 2024 primaries. We're well past excusing our choice by repeating the worn out phrase, at least he's better than the Democrat. That's a dishonest deflection. We could have chosen anyone in the primaries this year, and evangelicals looked at Donald Trump with our eyes wide open about his predatory nature and his aspirations to corrupt our democracy and said, that guy, I want that guy. Based on this year's primaries, white evangelicals strongly prefer Trump to every other candidate the GOP put forward. Once again, they've anointed him as their champion in a misguided culture war. 
All right. So that's the beginning of chapter one of A Christian Case Against Donald Trump. So please spread the word about these videos and about the book. I'm my own marketing department here, so I need all the help I can get getting the word out. So if you know of an influencer who might be interested in talking with me about the project, then I'll put my contact information down below. And if you do buy the book and find it helpful, please leave a good review on Amazon. And thanks for the daily encouragement that I'm getting from all of you. I'm not able to respond to all the comments, but I do see all of them, and they mean a lot to me. So until next time, thanks for listening.